Right, welcome back everybody and uh, very pleased that we all got through that little hiccup there. I'm not sure what happened, I'm not technically enough to um, know the ins and outs of YouTube but all it did, it flashed a couple of times with me and then disappeared. So for those of you who are, uh, are already back, um, if in the future if that ever happens again what um, you need to do is just to go off look for a new icon um, just like you join normally I'll quickly produce one just give me a couple of minutes to produce a new icon and then we'll uh, you'll be able to um, log on again and off we'll go again um, unfortunately I try my best, but I can't always beat technology. Or let's put it this way, technology beats me. Um, so I've just, um, there's only nine people, ten people that's showing at the moment. But Brian has just said that um, if you are enjoying his images this evening, you are very well uh, welcome to look up Brian on Facebook and a request to become a friend so that you see his images. Um, Brian usually, not always, but usually posts one image a day. And they're always very interesting images. Um, and what we're going to do, I'm going to drop you a quick line and I'm going to give you his email address as well as you requesting to become a friend so you see Brian's images. Um, if you could also drop him a, an email so that he knows who to expect um, because he doesn't accept, uh, accept everyone. Uh, he just accepts those people that he knows. Well, of course, he won't know our members' names, but if you drop him a line on an email, he will know and expect to get his uh, a request on Facebook to become friends and see his images. Uh, I don't want to give out his email over here, so I will send it to you privately. So, um, so for those, we've had another quite a few join just in the last few seconds. So that's a quick um, message from Brian saying, if you want to see more of his pictures, then uh, become friends with him on Facebook, and then you'll be able to see his post, which is usually one a day. Um, but do, do, do send him an email just so that he knows you're from Dunone Camera Club. Um, all you've got to put in the email is, Hi Brian, just sending you a um, email, uh, sorry, a messenger, uh, sorry, Facebook request. And he'll know that you're a member from Dunome then and just put Dunome Camera Club. Right, I'm going to hand you over to Brian um, because people are uh, just popping up again. We're, we are a few short, but uh, we are about on time. So we'll hand you back to Brian. Over to you, Brian. Okay, right, we'll move on to the next image then. Um, <clears throat> this one is uh, it's the New York Marching Band, um, and they're based in York. But they came down to Grimsby to do a performance in the, the People's Park in Grimsby. Uh, it's a six-piece band, two trumpets, saxophone, um, two pictures, saxophone, trombone, sousaphone, which is interesting, and a timpani guy. And uh, they, they do all the marching bit, going in and out to the audience and uh, really entertaining the audience. And they have a, a huge repertoire. But if you notice from this character, there's no music. And that, that's their reputation. They do it without music. Anyway, this is uh, one of the, I think he's the lead trumpet player, this one. And again, I, I went to sort of take a few. I, I'd gone with a very strange combination of cameras. I've taken a 40D with a, a 1530 on it. And I also took a, a, a 7D with a 24, sorry, a 7200 on it. So I sort of left myself a gap in the middle, but um, I was quite happy with that idea. So I'd gone from one extreme where I was using the 15 mil and... Uh, this character we've got in this photograph saw me, knelt down taking a photograph, and he walked that close up to me that he must have virtually touched me before he turned away. And I don't flinch on these sort of things. I just stay if I'm taking a photograph. Well, he'd fill the screen anyway, so he's pretty close. And then um, 
the 200 on the, which is this one's taken on the 200. Um, I, I, I've, okay, I've got a bit of a problem with this background area here, brightness here, which is fine. I'm, I'm not too worried. Again, I'm not worried about whether these are judged competition images or not. I'm just taking images that I enjoy making. And I, I've got this character here, but does that matter? And I don't think so because he's sort of soft, blurred, and you can see he's got his camera in his hand. He's not what he's up to. He's going to be taking the photograph from the other side in a minute. And I think this guy guy here actually is the percussionist as well. And I think he's talking to one of the young lads in the audience and sort of entertaining him at the same time. So there's things going on. But I, I like the, the detail we've got in this one. Um, nice nice tones there, sympathetic tones all the way round. He's well suntanned because he's out in the audience doing this on a regular basis. So that was the, where that one came from. This one, now this one is a, an interesting one. This one laid in the archive for a few years, to be quite honest with you. Um, it was actually taken in 2006, and I think it's only in the last two or three years that it's actually come out of the archive um, to be sort of looked at. Because when I looked at it, first of all, I thought there's nothing sharp, but then when I start and look closely, this word here is pin sharp. And I began to realize there is something sharp. So I then thought, okay, that's, that makes it interesting now because there's, everything is going on around it. And this is um, the National Cycle Race Championships in Beverly. And this guy rides for a Dutch team, which this is the Dutch team here. And um, I, I've managed to pan, I think it's um, on a, a one, uh, one sixtieth of a second pan. Uh, and he's ooh, not very far away from me. So it's a very fast pan. And actually get anything sharp is, is, is quite an achievement, I suppose, really. But we've got people in the background again, and the look is that they fell in the gaps. And there's no way I can see that when I'm taking this photograph. I, I'm struggling to keep my centre point on this point, never mind anything else. But this is where the look comes in. You finally look around it and you finally got people filling the gaps. And then this character coming in behind him, chasing him. Uh, it was a good year that year. The guy who came third was a young guy called... Um, uh, Geraint Thomas, so, uh, shot from Cadwell. Um, this is the classic car weekend. I, I've done various variations on this. I did one where the background was sharp and the foreground was blurred. And I did this one where the foreground is, is sharp and the background is blurred. I think this is taken at a 1 25th of a second panned, so we get plenty of motion in the wheels since there's relatively small wheels. Here's pin sharp. And the background, we can see it near enough, says cadwellpark.co.uk. And we've got lots of blur across there, so all that's just uh, Now, if I left it all that in colour, all these marshals along here are in orange, and it would have been really distracting. This is why I decided to go for, well, not quite popped colour, because there's more than one colour used, but I've tried to get the, the main subject in the colours, and the rest of it changed to monochrome. And again, concentrated on keeping it level across the bottom here. Um, that's on the start finish line if that's anybody who knows Cadwell. Another aircraft, not so successful this time. One of the Battle of Britain flight, uh, not enough movement in the plot prop, if we're honest. But again, it's that same sort of composition. I'm taking a line through there to this corner and a line through here again, that bit and that bit being roughly the same. I, I like that composition, as I say. So if I'm judging at your place, you know what to do, um, if you can remember it all anyway. The sky was looking on that day because they're nice and cloudy. Changing it to monochrome again uh, made it work even better. It took, it took the bits of blue that might have been through here out and uh, stopped them influencing things particularly. All right, this one is in Dubrovnik. I think, if I can pronounce it right, they call it the Poporela. Um, it's a pier that struts out into the harbour at um, in Dubrovnik. Uh, and I spotted this from the other side of the harbour and I decided that the bright sunlight was going to make a nice silhouette. So I, I converted it to silhouette by uh, underexposing it a little bit. And then we've got all this, uh, all these little groups across here, which are all nice and distinct. Um, again, I put it in a competition a couple of times. One person picked up this little likeness down here, which I could have got rid of. And there are such some rocks and people down here, which the they, they've got a bit concerned about. I'm, I'm not worried about any of that personally. I don't think that is a distraction. It's just, uh, as all judges, as we, we always know, we need something to be able to mark a, point, a picture down on for some reason. But evidently, this is where all the, the youngsters used to go and do the courting, um, which made it quite a popular place. 
down to London. Uh, we'd gone down to London. I think I was going down to do the Harry Potter, uh, not the Harry Potter experience, it's a, the Doctor Who walk. They walk you all around London, and I mean all around London, um, to show you the various buildings that have been used in various episodes of Doctor Who. Anyway, we were staying at the Tower Hotel um, near Tower Bridge, and this is actually taken from just outside the hotel. Um, I'd gone with it. I always carry from down there a, a, a pixie tripod, little mini pixie tripod, and I've taken a, an XT10 with me, a Fuji, 1855 lens, set it up on there. I shut the, the aperture down um, quite well to give a long focus. Um, in this case, it is. Uh, what is it? I, I've only gone down to 6.4. That must have been long enough what I was trying to do. Um, I mounted it on the wall, um, not ever so safe because it was a bit of a, one of these pointy walls, the apex on it, but I managed to get it wedged and I held it and uh, I used a timer to, to, to release the shutter so it was 10 second delay and then went for it and I was really pleased with this. I've got it composed so I've got this, this the, the horizon line on the third and this is on the, the, the third again. Um, nice blue night sky coming across the top there, the gold in the background here, plenty of colour down here, lovely reflections in the river with a bit of movement in there as well, just about, what was the actual exposure time? The exposure time was um, three and a half seconds. That's long enough to do that. You, know, you don't need a 20 odd second to do it. 20 odd seconds too often, sometimes it's too long. Um, but that's, that's what we've done with that one. So a little bit of technical explanation there. Now this is um, the National Mining Museum. Um, this is the Caphead Colliery one in Yorkshire. Uh, this is in the showers and uh, again it's the kind of place I'd seen photographs of it from various people like Mike Bennett and uh, who'd done them. Um, and I decided I'd go and I would go around it. So I think uh, I went round it one day and took all my photographs and then went back to the hotel and decided I got some missing because I wanted to make a panel out of it. So I went back the next day and took some more, and I think this was taken on day two, before we went off to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is only just up the road as well. So it's quite a good place to go for a sort of midweek break. You can do two or three events at the same time without too much travelling. Um, uh, this one, I've placed the, the Fuji camera. I think it's the Fuji on this one, better check. Um, yeah, I use the Fuji this day. I say check because I, I did some very strange things for this one. The first day, I think I used... Um, the Fuji and a Canon with a, a fisheye lens on it and the second day I went back with a Fuji and the the compact so um, it could have been either both the Fuji and the compact are very good in low light so I, I tend to use those in that kind of environment for the Fuji this time copes very well so I was for, set myself up for a nice symmetrical image down the center of the shower rails uh, and got the windows on one side and the wall on the other side very very dark um, again, the Fuji is very good under this situation. It tolerates a great deal of uh, what is called ISO invariant. So it doesn't really matter what ISO you use, you can always pull it back, which is useful as well. So that's uh, that's where that one's taken. Now this one, this one's taken at the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. Um, it was the first image of the day, actually. We arrived there about half past ten, and um, it was raining. And these creatures do not like to go out in the rain, so they decided to have a grooming session in one of the, these covered areas. This is taken on a 400mm lens, and it's on the full full length away, so you can't do much more with it. Uh, I've cropped in fairly tight on it to uh, just to come down to these two uprights on the either side and try to keep that sort of level. And I just like the fact that we've got what I assume is the dominant male at the front here with a, his friends grooming all the way down. The buy at the back here must be the lowest level one because they're not getting any benefit at all from it except enjoying grooming people. Yeah. It was absolutely chucking it down. In this version, you can't see it. But when I do it in monochrome, you can see the rain and everybody thought it was a noisy image and sort of marked it down. Anyway, it's just an interesting one. I like to see what animals get up to. Now, another one, this time the red arrow is at Cleethorpe. I've tried taking these several times and never done any good and I was quite pleased with this one and I'll tell you why I'm looking at this heart shape here 
it's a corkscrew maneuver and I've just managed to catch that where there's a nice heart shape this line going through it like an arrow so an arrow going through the heart and then we've got this blue line coming up that way as well so everything seems to fit into place again um, well backed off as far as the lens is concerned um, I'm backed off to 160mm on my 100-400 lens um, and it's just sort of timing and look. I think it look. It would have been really nice if that I joined up, possibly. But I don't know whether it would. I think the gap there is probably a little bit more beneficial. We've got all the aircraft here, and this one just above there. We've got this sort of line through there, which is nice. And um, they're sat on a sort of almost a third that way and a third this way. So there's a lot going for it as far as the composition is concerned. Right, this was another experiment. We went to, as a camera skills, well, a camera group, a Monday group, I think it was, we went to, um, this one is uh, Hall Farm, which is in Harpswell, uh, near Gainsborough, I think that is. And I'd gone out with the intention of doing some, some macro type shots, but I don't have a proper macro lens anymore. So what I chose to do was I set up um, my, X, my Canon 7D with a, a 70 to 200 telephoto lens, f2.8 lens on, and I put a 20 millimeter automatic tube in between. And I went as close as I could to get the maximum magnification. I think from top to bottom, that's just over an inch. <coughs> um, and it's shot at um, f6. So even at f6, there's very little in the background that's going to be sharp, but it does give me enough sharpness for right across the plant, which is one of the things I wanted to achieve. Uh, so I've gone, I, I use a, a Manfrotto tripod with the, the geared three-way head. Um, and I find that's great because I can frame up really, really accurate with that one. And then I've got a, a, a remote to go with it as well. So that's sort of the kind of kit I was using that day. Uh, a simple se se selected on this acanthus that the number of flower heads I want, the three here, and it's, it just all seems to fall together for me. Again, the use of negative space, you'll find I use it a lot of the time. Okay, there's some white in the background. Perhaps that's going to mark it down, but it doesn't matter. I like the image, so that's all that matters. And if you do the same with your own images, don't worry about it. Right, this one, uh, Abbasock. Interesting place, Abbasock. It's in North Wales, and it's on the bit that points out at the top, that points across towards Anglesey. Um, and it, it's a, a bit of a strange place because you get there, everybody says it's beautiful and well it is sort of we got there about dinner time found it difficult to park um, I didn't spend too long on the beach there because I managed to take about 30 or 40 photographs very quickly um, and decided we'd move on this is looking back towards the shore from down the, the peninsula here um, I, I like these buildings on the right hand side, they're very, very modern buildings there, very expensive looking buildings. And this is the beach area here, so it's, they're actually beach properties which look very ex exclusive and some more over here. So obviously there's some people with a few pennies around there. And uh, the other problem I found there is that they didn't have anywhere we could get to eat. So um, uh, we sort of decided we'd have a look around the peninsula and we went off down the peninsula, ended up in going as far as we could, and it was that far that we ended up having to back out for about half a mile because I couldn't turn around. Uh, not a very successful day. I didn't actually get fed until four o'clock, which is bad news. Anyway, well, this one, um, it's a bit of a strange one. I'd spent a day at the um, Big Cack Sanctuary in Smarden in Kent, and it's, you'd be surprised if that's the kind of picture you come back with. Well, there's one more later on, possibly, if we get that far, which is even stranger. But this is just something I thought the tiger was there. It's an Amur tiger. And it's so close to the fence. And I thought, well, OK, it's the look in its eyes and everything else. And with the grid there, um, should it be in captivity? Well, I know it should because they're breeding down at smart and they're, they're doing a grand job and in fact just recently they've had um, some cubs which where they've got a big photo opportunity geared up for about this time of year um and which they had a, a a draw for, for who would actually be allowed to go down and have to sort of handle the cubs and take the photographs and they had to cancel it because of the covid this unfortunate pandemic 
Anyway, this was one of the shots I took there. I took quite a few of the animals themselves. Uh, I remember it particularly well because um, when we first got there, the, you're allowed to go up to that uh, grid there and put your camera lens in between it if you want to. And I got myself settled down there watching this tiger coming towards me. I'm thinking, well, I'm getting it right till it's full in the frame and I'm going to get it right. Unbeknown to me, the, the keeper has a trick with the tigers. He will turn his back on the tiger and the tiger will come to the net and jump up at it. Well, I'm knelt on one knee in front of this fence with my lens right up against the net, up against the mesh, and this tiger comes at me and jumps straight over me. Surprisingly enough, I did not move. Uh, everybody else was laughing at me, but I didn't move. I, I don't give in. Anyway, that's why I took that one. Okay, so this is uh, obviously uh, uh, Leicester Square. Uh, taken on a compact again. I think it's on the it's on the Fuji again. Uh, we, we, we have a habit of walking around London at night. I think we're coming back from the theatre actually on this occasion. And stopped there. I, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to take a photograph of this. And with this one, I think the, the whole point about this one is, is look, because virtually everything is lit up. Um, and it fills the frame nicely, and there's some nice tones in there. And again, I think it's the only the fact that the camera's got these special qualities that I managed to get a photograph out of it that's of anything like worth printing. But yeah, interesting. Another one at Cadwell. Now, I don't know how many of you know Cadwell, but um, at the end of the first start, finish straight is a, a curve called Charlie's, which is a very shallow curve, uh, which goes to the left and then starts to climb as it goes up to um, sorry let's get this right way around um, it starts at Coppice, Coppice is the left hander sorry at the end of the street and it's going up to Charlie's which is a big sweeping right hander and uh, it's blind as far as the photographer is concerned you can hear the bikes coming down the main straight and it's up to you to sort of be ready so um, I for this one, I, I pre-focused on the, the, the red Arnco down this side here um, before the bike arrived. And then I turned to face where I would first see it. Now, it is only a fraction of a second from picking it up to taking the photograph. You've got to be really ready for it and have a go. And um, I, I wanted to get one where I could see the advertising on the base of the bike. Now, one of the consequences of this is everything else goes out of focus, but anybody who's done this kind of photography knows that you can't get everything in focus. Even if you've got it bang on and you've taken it as they're going past you, because the back and the front of the bike are at a different position and effectively travelling at a different speed relative to you, to get it all sharp is virtually impossible. So there's almost certainly going to be somewhere that's not very sharp. As long as it's got enough detail in it, it doesn't really matter. Again, we've got movement in the wheels, and we've got plenty of detail around here. And again, I've chosen something with plenty of colour. Now, I've obviously watched and watched for these coming up. I don't know. I know roughly when this character's coming up because I've taken notice of who's ahead of him and who's behind him sort of thing. So it's, you stand a chance of doing it, but it, it takes a lot of concentration. Um, but it's good fun trying it. When you get a cattle a lot, you've got to try and something, find something different to have a go at, and that's one of the something difference I found. Oh, this one, this is a, a bit of a strange one. This is at Bradgate Park near Nottingham. Again, I'd been over for that uh, photo shoot and went, uh, stayed overnight, so we went into Bradgate Park in the morning because I'd been told about the deer there. It was uh, the deer up time, and I've foolishly only gone in with a, an XT10 with an 1855 lens on it. And I was watching these deer and keeping well away, using the maximum length of the lens on it. And this photographer says, he says, you're okay, come on over here, you can get closer. So I went as close as I dare to him. This, this deer on the right-hand side here, he's been in a mud wallow. And he's, he's actually got himself caked, couldn't proper. He's, he's smelling beautiful for ladies. And I got very close to the point where he actually filled the frame on a 55mm lens. Not exactly the sensible thing to do, it being so that. But I then watched this lady walking across the field. She'd come from all the way across the back here somewhere, and you could, I'd seen her in the background in one or two of the other images, and I thought to myself, well, she's not going to come past here, surely, but if you look, there's the path. She's only about a foot off the path, and this thing has seen her, and she doesn't take any notice, she just keeps walking. She obviously must have done it on a regular basis, so. but I just thought it made an interesting image, because it's something different. <laughs> this one, um, these are the block of flats. I was going to Camden Market, 
I walked on the way up there. This trio of flats were there. Surprisingly enough, they didn't look quite like that. Um, I was doing an exercise on replacing skies and modifying pictures, and I came up with this one as one of the examples. So I selected the sky and put a, an interesting stormy sky in. I then went around here and uh, put in much stronger colours because this is very bleached and there and here to get the nice three primary colours up there. I then added some sunshine on this face here, uh, added some blue into various windows and uh, sort of made it look more entertaining. And uh, it was quite a good exercise. People have enjoyed looking at that one. It's, it's, it's good fun. It's not true. You know, it's just me playing. Another one at the National Mining Museum, a straight photograph. But that's not bad for a model, is it? I mean, he looks real. Um, that's the control room in the old mines. Uh, just a quick shot. That one's a record shot, really. Now, this one is, is played about with, surprisingly enough. I mentioned earlier along about the breakwater at the end of um, uh, Wonderland. This is actually the whale tail breakwater. You've got, there's the... That's the, the tail of the whale tail. If you imagine that coming around this way and that going around that way, and this continuing all the way through to it, you can see some rocks in the middle here. That's where that is. So that is the whale tail. That's one photograph taken on a 30-second uh, a exposure, giving us a nice milky um, sea here. Ten stopper, um, neutral density, graduated filter at the top. This castle is Beaver Castle. I'd been to the mud, mud, tough mudders at Beaver. I'd taken a photograph of the castle from a distance. I thought, oh, that's, that's decent. So I, I changed the lighting on it a bit, messed about. Uh, this foliage is actually round it from Beaver, um, blended it in with the island, put some water in here so it looked like an island rather than this was continuous, added some cloud in the background here, added some more cloud that side of the island, that side of the island, somewhere in between. And surprisingly enough, these polar bears weren't there. They were actually at Doncaster. Um, but I put those in just to fill that space and entered it into a creative competition. It, it, it was OK. I think somebody commented they enjoyed it or something. I can't remember now. It doesn't really matter. It was good fun to do it anyway. I keep playing with these creative things, not intended to do anything, just to try and improve my skills as I go along. Right, okay, this is a very simple image. It's a, a kitchen taken at um, the Flat Country Museum. Um, it's a 50s kitchen. I posted this on the internet some time ago with a bit of a storyline to go with it. And what I got back was a load of uh, people said, oh, I used to have scales like those and a mincer like that and a kettle. And it gen generated quite a lot of nostalgia. Now, as far as taking the photograph is concerned, the photograph has been taken on a, on a Panasonic LF1, little compact camera, and um, it handles very well in low light. It's, it's great when you're going to a museum or a country house, it's the kind of camera you want with you. Um, it's very versatile and it does tolerate some very, very strange lighting. I do tend to shoot uh, in semi-manual with auto ISO. Um, and try and just to, to make sure I've got a, I might shoot shutter priority to make sure I can hand hold it, throw in auto ISO and let it look after itself after that. And it tends to work very well. But with this one, I, I framed it up to make sure the walls are vertical and the table's horizontal. And I got all these, the detail in the bottom here of everything I wanted. I've just kept that saucepan uh, handle in at the top. And then it's interesting to go and look around and see what you can find. And, uh, uh, I did actually examine what's up here, for instance, and see what's in that sort of area there. I think that's a potato chipper, the old metal thing that you push the potato in and it came out as chips. And uh, there's the bread bin and there's a few other bits and bobs around that people found interesting. And the recipe book, I did try and find out what the recipe was. So I zoomed in quite closely, but I couldn't get into detail. It was, it's just the fact that it's an exercise for students to sort of frame it all up and make a, a nice composition out of it. It's a challenge. Across the road from there is the wireless shop, the old hi-fi shop. Um, now this raises another issue because um, I placed the character on the right-hand side and the right-hand third, but she's looking out of the picture. Now I, I've been reading Michael Freeman's work just recently and he says that that is supposed to generate the idea of you want to know who she's talking to. 
So it's creating a story for you to fill in. You know she's obviously talking to someone. She's trying to sell one of these things. This is not. This is one of the early Bakelite tele radios, by the way. That and at twelve and a half guineas, it was quite expensive when you consider that's there. And this television, this radio here, is nine pound ten. But um, this, uh, I love these horns. I mean, I, I've got like my hi-fi, but I haven't got horns like that. I must admit. Um, the actual setting is nineteen. 39 on the eve of the war and it's as the shop was set on that very day and it's been faithfully recreated at uh, the backcountry museum again so it's quite an interesting place to go and have a look around and see what's there this one's taken at dudley zoo um through glass so always through a bit of a problem so i decided to, decided to go low key with this one blacked out the edges kept the detail there change to monochrome it sort of works quite well there's plenty of detail and it. it's taken a, a Panasonic GH2 I, I went for the four thirds camera as my holiday camera for a while it's probably the most expensive camera I ever bought um, but yeah it, it served me quite well for a while it, I changed that I traded that in for the Fuji in the end in about 2015 but it was a very good camera to have around. It was with a 14 140 lens on it. That's 28 280 in real money. Um, it was quite a useful camera. You could you could do quite a lot with it. Now this one's taken at Staines. Um, we dropped in at Staines. We'd been up to the Goth, the Goth weekend at Whitby, and we're coming home doing the various places on the way down the coast as we came along, and we dropped in at Staines, and I. I, I most people take stains from a bridge which is high above stains and looking down over the valley over the sea. I'm not impressed with that. Certainly on the day we were there, it wasn't very good anyway. So on this occasion, I went down on the beach and I had a look around there and I, I spotted this little uh, source of water going out to the sea and this beautiful S curve on it. So I thought, yeah, okay, we've got to work with that one. So I went into portrait mode and uh, set myself with a couple of boulders in the bottom corners, the old JCBs. And a bit of nice detail in this force here. This character here, he's trying to break this piece off to see if he ends up in the water. So he's got a bit of a story there. That's the boss. She's gone for a walk. Uh, some more people down here. This is my friend Steve, who's down there doing what Steve usually does. He takes his camera and then he looks at the sights and decides what's going on and enjoys the sights and gets home a few rumors. He hasn't taken any photographs. But it was just the way this is all composed, put together. I just love the way it folds down there. There's all these echoes of shapes going down here. And it sort of leads you through because it is this S-bend. You go down there fairly slowly. If it had been a straight line, you'd gone straight down to Steve and you'd been bored by that straight away. So it just makes you steady up as you go through the picture. And it's always good for that reason. Right, this one was taken at a, a flying shoot. I was very disappointed because they were flown on... Uh, string effectively plastic wire I didn't close line I didn't approve of that uh, so I've had to do a bit of work to get rid of that um, I, this is what Michael Freeman calls a nearly shot and he has this idea that um, if you'd waited till the owl had actually touched the post it would not be anywhere near as interesting as if you catch it just before it gets there. You're anticipating that it's going to get there. It's like approaching a finish line. You get to them just before the finish line, and there's always this element of doubt in your mind. Did they actually manage to cross it? You know, and it's that sort of thing. This nearly is something, a concept that Michael likes to sort of suggest. And I've been looking through and seeing that I often use it, so um, it's something I approve of. What I like about this one is the, the curve here. I don't quite know what's going on. There's some damage to the feathers up there. Um, nice curve of the wings there. We managed to keep plenty of detail in that in the bird itself. The jesse and everything else has been taken out of it, and it's acceptably well done. Um, it, it, it's the background. It was a grotty day for background. There's so much, so many gaps in this fence, this hedge down here which we were all facing up against. Uh, you, you couldn't really get a decent image out of them. It was a bit of a dead loss, really. It was at Hamilton Zoo where it happened. Do you remember Hamilton Zoo had a tiger attack a keeper not too long ago? Mm. It was about two years after I went. Uh, I'd photographed the two tigers involved. Anyway, this one, uh, I think this is taken in the garden, this one, with a macro lens, 180 macro lens. 
Um, yeah, that's correct. And F, the, the 180 Sigma 3.5 microns, which I picked up relatively cheap from Conley's. Now, what I like about this one, again, I didn't notice on the day, I just concentrated on the, on the spider. But look, there's a parcel of food here, and there's another parcel of food there. Uh, and now I never noticed that till I started, started playing with it. And again, we've got this line going through it, which I, I sort of use in my composition line. Um, there's a brightness there, which is another parcel of food, I think, which should really be taken out. But I was too interested in seeing what's going on down here, so I didn't bother with that. It was a bit of a throwaway, really, but it's, it's an interesting shot in itself. Another macro shot that's taken with the same lens, the um, same combination. This is a, a Luilia Cardinalis. It was a, in my pond at the time, and the, the muck, mucky brown colour behind you is actually the pond itself. So um, this is probably about an inch across the flower. Um, so it's a fairly good shot. Plenty of detail there. The, the, the lead plant is well handled. Uh, red can always be a bit of a problem when you're working with digital cameras. They seem to um, very easily overexpose red. Um, you, you take your meter reading, it looks okay, but then you find the red has been a bit naughty and gone off the end. So it, this is quite well handled considering that. Well, this one is the, the Steelworks at Redcar. Um, I'd seen a friend's photograph of this one. He'd placed it uh, more about halfway, I think it was. Uh, but he'd got a, a exercise in the horses on the beach, and he got them into the photograph. When I got there, there was horses on the beach, and so I went down there, took the photograph, and went away. When I looked at it, after we'd been for a coffee, I realised they weren't sharp. So I went back, OK, there's nobody there, but I have got... Uh, a person in the landscape. So I've got some sort of scale. And if you look in the background here, there's even more people. Here's his dog down here. More people over there, very tiny. And then there's this is before the steel works. I think it has closed. No, it hasn't closed down because we've got a bit of smoke coming out there. But it's very close to just where it's about to close down. Um, lovely stormy sky, a little bit of work being done in there. Um, nice reflections from the buildings and the, the shoreline here. It, it works quite nicely for me. A crop down that side, down this side, sort of placing this central area, uh, the mass of that in the centre, really, and keeping it there. The sky is fairly well handled. Small amount of blue coming through there, which is fine. An interesting image. Another spider. This was taken at, I think it was taken at Wisby. Um, yeah, this is taken at Wisby. This is with a 75 300 again. Um, I'm, I'm surprised how detailed this one is, really, because it's a, on a 40D, which is probably 10.1 megapixels, something like that. Absolute pin, nothing there these days in comparison to modern sensors, so it's a, quite a small sensor. Um, but it's, it's got plenty of detail in it, and lots of detail in the web there. Very random web, isn't it? I mean, it's, a, it's all over the place, that one. It's, it's, I did do some work on this one somewhere around here. There was a bright spot in that area there. I thought, oh, no, I can't do that one. I've got to sort that out. So I sort of continued that area and built it up into this area here using one or two layers. It says it's always better to do it one or two layers. <coughs> Here's the other one from the uh, big cat sanctuary. That's a snow leopard paw. And I included that because you look how curved those claws are and how far they extend. Um, they could do some damage. They've been known to grab hold of lenses. They weren't the worst cat for it. The worst cat was actually a very small cat. Um, I think it was a Chinese fishing cat. And there was three of them in this particular enclosure. And you get very close to it. And what they'd do is they'd get one of them to get your attention. And the other two would sneak around behind you. And on one occasion, they were known to take a, a, a fairly expensive lens off the front of a camera little beasts they could reach through the mesh and get at you and so if you didn't i mean i went at the spot and my bot my boss was with me and she was watching my back and watching them so if anything came when well, i wasn't supposed to sort of know that, that i couldn't see them she would tell me but they can you can imagine getting caught by one of those can't you you wouldn't get away easily put it that way around Uh, Strancher taken at the mill farm again, same com organisation as last time, 20 mil tube, 
Uh, I did a little bit of work on one of these petals up here. It was really badly damaged, but not finished it completely. Just uh, looking at the backgrounds, tones, and colours. It's... Now, this is an interesting one for me. Uh, this is taken at the Film Museum in London, Covent Garden. And they had the Bond in Motion exhibition on, and uh, in the basement there, they've got all of the Bond cars up to whatever it was at this time. This is the first one, obviously. And associated with each one, you've got this big screen in the background showing a sequence from this film. So I managed to get myself... The, the lighting, by the way, is absolutely atrocious. This is extremely dark around here. And there's the odd spotlight on the car. Um, you can see another one in the background here. It's lit by just the odd spotlight. So it's all... It's not designed for photographers, shall we say. It's not for you, photographer-friendly. Got a flash spot here from one of the... Well, not a flash, because I didn't use flash. So I got myself spotted down with the 18 mil on here. And uh, I'm watching this to see when that character is in a good position. So it's a very short clip which goes over and over again, but it's a case of waiting till the right time. So I've got myself positioned in the right frame of this. they have got the, the framing set up for the, the shadows and everything else. And I'm just watching that scene. I've got, I'm squatted down and holding my camera, and I, I'm fairly sure this is a slow shutter speed as well. Um, I've taken that at 1 15th of a second. I've flipped the uh, screen out so I can see what's going on. And it's at 3,200 ISO as well. So um, it's quite an accomplishment to get a decent image out of it at all. And I, I, I managed to get a relevant sh uh, projected image with most of the images I took that day. But it did take a while. We were actually there waiting for the bus to come home. So it was a fill-in experience, but it was well worth it. I enjoyed that one. This... Um, Surprisingly enough, this is taken in Chester. Chester Cathedral has its own falconry, and they run exhibitions and this uh, demonstrations rather. And this was uh, in the back of the cathedral. There, you go around the back and pay to go in. You take your photographs with you, and um, great. Um, so this is in the the enclosure where they're kept. And I just like the fact that this we've got this falcon in the foreground, echoed by another one in the background. I took a few on the day, to say the least. And then we did the flying. Well, on this occasion, I actually took my Fuji X-T10. But I put the 55-200 lens on this time. I'm not fully happy with that. It doesn't balance like a, a DSLR. Uh, sorry, a DSLR. Um, uh, uh, a mirrored camera, shall we say. Um, so it wasn't quite as well balanced in my hand. Um, so I've never been really confident with it. But I tried it on this occasion. This is taken with the 55-200. Um, I got some quite decent shots, especially of the kids interacting with them, which was interesting, trying to get the, the, the bird landing on the hands or just leaving the hands and the, the hiding or flying in between them, various things that they did as a demonstration. Now, another quote, OK, to me, photography is the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of an event as well as of the precise organisation of forms which give that event its proper expression. So this is this is the, where the skills come in, isn't it? This is the ability to look at a, a situation and de decide exactly what you need to include and exclude, um, and do it in a very very short period of time. Because they, like they say, that photograph exists for a fraction of a second, after which it can never be repeated. So this was uh, another th quote that I thought was relevant. Just press on, um, and this is one where I've, I've used that because uh, at this point in time. Uh, I've spotted this conversation going on, and we've just got the right expression. We've got the, the link here, the link here, and this one, we're not sure which one is speaking, of, but we've collected it in the period of time where we've definitely got the concentration on both of them, both of the mouth open, beautiful detail, gone for the square crop just to keep enough of him in so they can see where the contact is being made, and it, it sort of works. Beautiful colours in her hair as well with the almond hair and the, the red and the black of the uh, scarf in there as well. Another one, this is taken at uh, to my cross again. These are prairie rats. Um, the front one's sharp, the second one isn't quite, but does it matter? Not really. They're doing what prairie rats do, observing and eating. And uh, that's about it. So, yeah, okay. Now, this is... Uh, I, I regularly used to go to the um, Cleethorpe's Carnival Parade. Um, this was... A few years back now, because 
I, I moved from this spot. This spot is outside a pub at uh, the top of the hill at Cleethorpes. And it, it's, it's a problem with the lighting because the, the lighting is very rarely there. It's, it's always afternoon and the lighting is always coming from uh, behind the buildings. So you really need to get in some gaps to sort of get the lighting coming through. If you go on the other seaside, you're on the wrong side because you're, you're in shadow all the way. So it's a case of getting in the right place, getting in the right spot. I think I've taken about four photographs of this young lady. Um, and in some respects, the others might have been more entertaining because she got a, a white top on and it was rather well filled. But I didn't particularly go for those. I, this is the last shot I take. I took rather. And I just love the expression on her face. Now, it's just a shame that I've got this character walking behind her with a white balloon. Um, I could do something with it, but I, I'm not going to bother because I just enjoy the face. Whatever you say, because of Gestalt, uh, uh, you, uh, no, it's the... Uh, not Gestalt, it's um, the visual mass. The visual mass, these eyes have the greatest visual mass in this image. Uh, the visual mass idea says that eyes, the thing that will draw you first, faces next, people next, and then text. So you've got very strong eyes with a very strong face and a person, and that is really going to pull your eye. I know you're going to go into that occasionally and back again, but you're really going to always get pulled back to that. So that sort of saves my bacon a bit, with that being that white balloon there. Just a shame. Another reenactment uh, character. I, I, I love this one because... Uh, it's, you have to imagine the story is telling, and um, I, it looks to me like one of the fish that got away. It was that big, you know. It's one of those stories, and he's got his cigar there, and his face is absolute character, full of character, and, uh, and he's talking to the character on the left hand side. But it's the character on the right hand side whose face that you can't really see very much of, but you can see enough. It's blurred. He doesn't approve by the looks on his face. Um, so there's a storyline going on there. But what other people have always pointed out with this one, they think it's James May taking a photograph behind him. Uh, I don't think it is, but if you look at the hairstyle and the jeans, it could well be James May. Okay. Our studio shot, my, my, ton, my daughter breeds uh, long-haired dachshunds, and this was three of the troop at the time. I think she's got six now. Just had four more. She's bred and gone to new homes. Um, so this was just me going to the studio to take a photo shot for her, uh, a couple of a couple of spots and um, tripod, nothing particularly clever, a little bit of burnout on this one's head, but uh, not too bad. Um, this is an echinacea, this was taken in a farm again, this is Hill Farm, which is somewhere near Caister. Um, I, I focus very shallow on this one and I get a lot of stick for this one because most of the judges want to see that piece here, which I find particularly uninteresting. I like the, the petals at the foreground here and the fact that we've got the colours in the background. For me, that, that works. Other people just said they want to see that or more of it. Again, I like my shallow depth of field, so I don't tend to uh, worry too much. A Corsac Fox, this was taken at Hamilton Zoo. Uh, these little devils don't stay still. Um, they run all over the place and focusing up on them is the devil. So it was a case of trying lots of shots and coming up with one. Again, they use the negative space. That is a log in the background there. Um, you couldn't get away from that from where you could view them. So it was a case of lump it really. Another long shutter speed. Uh, this is a 30 second shot. Um, again, a 10 stopper with a two stopper grad across the top. Um, I set my tripod up down on the sloping slipway that we saw earlier on, um, leveled it all up using the, the various gauges on it, uh, mounted the camera, framed it all up. I'd got the, the uh, filter holder in place already um, and the uh, remote attached to it. Uh, once I got it all framed up, I checked on the camera to make sure that its horizontal was still saying the same thing, and it was. Uh, assembled it all and I took a meter reading and it was beyond 30 seconds. So what I did was, I, I think I'd taken it down to F22. I backed it off to F20 and that gave me down to 30 seconds. So I took the shot and uh, again, I tried this one in the competition and the, the judge decided he wanted something in there, like a monster or something. Okay, fine. I, got, I thought I'd got the reflection of that, but it's not quite yellow enough to make it interesting. Anyway, no worries. 
another tricky one. This one is um, it's in the Great Barn at um, uh, East Riddleston, I think it is. Uh, yeah, East Rid Riddleston Hall. Um, this is a, a barn they've got there, which is lit by the odd spotlight like this. It's actually virtually pitch black in there. You have to wait for your eyes to re to, to accustom to it. Um, but I could see this um, coach in the background there, and I decided I wanted to take a photograph of it. So again, I got my little pixie tripod with me. So I've set my Fuji X-T10 up on an 1855 lens um, down on the ground. Now, being the Fuji, which is mirrorless, it means that the LCD screen shows you what the, the, the camera is going to take. So you can actually use it to help frame things up, even though you can't see what's going on, it can. So I used it to sort of frame the image up and then shut it all back down again, set the ISO and set the, the, the decide to let it run its own time. So I, I just press the button for a 10-second uh, wait and let it go its own, and that's what it came up with. Obviously, there's a fair amount of work gone into that to bring it out in the end. But um, again, the Fuji being this ISO invariant tolerates all this sort of stuff. The, the unfortunate piece is this one sort of ray of light coming in through there from the vent. The barn is used for weddings. Um, must have some more lights in it somewhere. But when we went, it was just in the, there was a door open and that was it. You could go in, but there's no light going in worth talking about. Just uh... so, just a quick yeah. one there, Brian. We are just mm -hmm. past nine o'clock. Do yeah, you we'll have a, a few to go yet, or...? Oh, yeah, I'm halfway through. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> right. OK, we're plenty. I'll just talk about this one, then we can pack it up. I'll just have a look which one's after it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. No, we'll just have a look at this one, then we'll call it a day. That's fine. Okay. Um, I, as I say, I prepared that many. I had no idea how long it was going to take. And uh, but this one, I, I do um, my one bit of event photography quite often is going to what we call the Lynx League Evening Road Race League, and this is a series of cycle races that's held at various venues in Lincolnshire, from right down from Grantham up to Barton uh, and across to Grimsby. And this uh, this is taken at full stow. Um, the the problem with this kind of event is that it starts at seven o'clock at night and it runs through till half past eight, any time from April through to August. So the lighting can be, shall we say, challenging. Um, and what I've done is I've developed a system whereby I now shoot in uh, manual. I set my shutter speed and I set my aperture that I require and I throw in auto ISO with a bit of restrictions on it. Uh, for a shot like this, I actually frame it all up before I start. I pre-focus on this white line down here. Um, I, I chose that I wanted that as my right-hand side, and I knew that I'd watch the circuit, cyclists come around. It's a circuit race. So I get a chance to see them come around this more than once. So I knew where the cyclists were going to be. So I framed it up exactly as it is now, and I, I waited. And as soon as I say this character gets excited, I know he's, the riders are coming. So I, I, I've pre-focused on here. I pick the cyclist up about there. I follow him. And I start pressing somewhere when he, get, when he gets about here. So he picks up. The, there's virtually move, no movement. It's, it's instantaneous. And I follow him to just where I want him there, having set that focus point as well. And then just click and take the full shutter down. And when I say talk about being look, if you have a look here, we have character, 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 nobody behind him, character, 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 one more there. And that's the look of finding everything in the right places at the right time. Um, I'm actually squatting in the gutter over the far side in the long grass, trying to hope I don't can get up after it's happened because I usually get down there quite early and wait for them coming around the corner. Anyway, that'll do. That's fine. That's great, <laughs> Hope you've been Brian. entertained. Well, your comment a minute ago has just um, created some uh, discussion because uh, 
you made a little well whether you made a mistake or not i'm not quite sure but you mentioned that you was halfway through so people are saying we can always ask brian it back again <laughs> <laughs> so um it sounds like uh, you may be um wanted again at some point in the uh, near future so that's no problem i've got, got plenty to go at <laughs> yeah, during your images we had a tremendous amount of i like that image that's great i love that sky i love this i love that so um we've also got um some remarks coming in now thanking you very much and uh, a great talk great images etc etc so thank you very much for that brian and uh, thanks for having me on behalf of everybody um we've had up to 25 in this uh, uh sorry 24 in this session um thank you very much for all 24 of us and i'll just say to everybody um thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again next thursday can't remember what it is next thursday but uh, thank you all for sticking with us um sorry about the little lick up in part one but uh, technology does beat me at times. So, once again, thank you very much, Brian. You're welcome. Thanks uh, for inviting me. So, it gave me something to sort of think about and uh, Yeah, I must admit, <laughs> when even I, when I look at your images, it does, it does show you that you can break the rules and get away with it and have an amazing image at the end of it. So, thank you very much. So, I'll say thank you to everybody, and uh, I'll sign off now, and I'll just have a final chat to Brian before he goes. So, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Brian. And we'll, thank you. Uh, Bye, everybody. Yep, and we'll uh, catch you all next week.